Secretary General of the Council of Europe, Deputy Secretary General, Secretary General of the Assembly. It is a very great honor for me to take on the presidency of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe at this time. And I would like first and foremost to thank the political groups, including in particular my own group, which, based on the agreement on the rotation of the presidency, have placed the trust in me. I would also like to thank all members of the Assembly who have endorsed this agreement and whose consent has made my appointment possible. And now allow me to say just a few words in Italian. Mi è molto chiaro che in democrazia ogni potere scaturisce dal libero consenso dei membri di una comunità. Sono questi a conferirlo o a toglierlo. E chi esercita un potere democratico sa che questo è un potere che gli è stato solo temporaneamente affidato. Non gli appartiene, ma gli deriva da altri e ad altri egli o ella deve rispondere. La democrazia che qui rispettiamo non definisce solo un modello di investitura del potere, ma anche un modello di esercizio del potere, caratterizzato da accountability e responsiveness. Questi valori sono stati incarnati da chi mi ha preceduto, Stella Chiriachides, che vorrei ringraziare per la discrezione, la saggezza, l'equilibrio con cui ha rivestito questo ruolo delicato, con un grande senso della dignità dell'istituzione, creando un'atmosfera di serenità e di leale collaborazione in un momento non facile della nostra vita. Grazie Stella. Infine devo un ringraziamento al mio Paese, l'Italia, e ai miei concittadini che leggendomi in Parlamento mi hanno consentito di svolgere un intenso lavoro alla Camera dei Deputati e nella nostra Assemblea. Mi piace pensare che il Consiglio d'Europa non vive solo della volontà dei governi che hanno stipulato tra loro un trattato, ma vive della volontà dei cittadini, delle loro risorse, del loro mandato. Tutto in democrazia rimanda all'idea della sovranità dei cittadini e al fatto che i rappresentanti del popolo sono loro trustees and servants, come dice la bella Declaration of Rights della Virginia. È la seconda volta che un italiano riveste questo importante incarico. Prima di me è stato presidente di questa assemblea Giuseppe Vedovato negli anni 1972-1975. Studioso di diritto internazionale e valente politico, ha presieduto l'Assemblea nel momento assai delicato della dittatura e della successiva caduta del regime dei colonnelli greci, quando è stata poi restaurata la democrazia. Ma accanto al nome di Vedovato, nell'assumere questo incarico, non posso non pensare al nome di altri due grandi europeisti italiani, Alcide De Gasperi, proveniente dalla mia stessa regione, il Trentino Alto Adige e Suttirol, e Altiero Spinelli. Entrambi hanno maturato il loro ideale di un'Europa unita nelle carceri fasciste, sperimentando la privazione della libertà personale, hanno compreso che il rispetto della dignità di ogni persona, le libertà fondamentali e la giustizia sono a rischio là dove prevale il nazionalismo e possono meglio essere garantite da un orizzonte europeo dove i diritti fondamentali trovano la suprema garanzia in una Corte sovranazionale. I now shall continue in English. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, in times of difficulty it must always be remembered 
that the great conquests of European civilization represent the fruits of past struggle and sacrifice. There is not one single article in our convention or indeed in our democratic constitutions that is not the result of struggles of men by men, women, workers and minorities of all persuasions who by their efforts, their commitment and their very lives have fought for the rights and defended their ideals. Nothing has been given away for free and everything that has been achieved has been hard fought. Altiero Spinelli used to say that Europe does not fall from the sky and the same is true for freedom, democracy and human rights. And so if we think of the extraordinary hopes and energy that emerged during much more difficult times and how on the ruins of an era of slavery we Europeans were able to build an era of freedom when confronted with the difficulties of today we must not lose heart and give in to pessimism. Our European anthem is the ode to joy. Not everybody knows it, but the European anthem was proposed as an anthem for the Europe we are building by our assembly in 1971. The same is true for the 12 star European flag, which symbolizes European unity worldwide and is also used as the European Union emblem. This was designed here at the Council of Europe. We can be proud of how much we have created that has met with success. And yet, the ode to joy starts with the words, Freunde, nicht diese Töne, or friends, no more of these sounds. In other words, let's cast aside the sounds of lamentation and rediscover the will to build. Over the course of 2017, the Assembly forcefully stressed in the resolution on the fourth summit the need to reinforce the unity of the Council of Europe as the only European institution that brings together 47 countries around the values of human rights, democracy, the rule of law and acceptance of its European court, placing at the heart of our continent's life the principles laid down in the European Convention on Human Rights and the European Social Charter. At a time of great and dramatic challenges, from terrorism to migration, from poverty, old and new, to mistrust in representative institutions, from the re-emergence of racism and xenophobia, to the desperate solitude of so many people, we must offer a response to nationalist and chauvinistic temptations, to close ranks, to centrifugal pressures, and to conflicts by reasserting the need for peace and justice on our continent. As a pan-European political forum and a statutory body of our organization, our assembly should play fully its role in addressing these challenges. This requires an active involvement of all members and delegations from all 47 member states. In this context, I regret that the Russian Parliament did not put forward a delegation for the 2018 ordinary session. Nevertheless, dialogue with Russian parliamentarians and with all the other delegation is continuing in full respect of our rules and obligations. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, last year our assembly made a clear political call for a fourth summit of the heads of state and government in order to reassert on the highest level 
the Member States' commitment to ensuring that the Council of Europe can be the common European home of all, respecting the equal dignity, integrity and freedom of each member, along with the undertaking by all to remain true to the European Convention of Human Rights, along with all the other conventions, and to contribute faithfully to the life of the institution. Let me quote a paragraph from that resolution. As part of the preparatory work for the summit, the Assembly resolves to continue its own reflection on its identity, role and mission as a statutory organ of the Council of Europe and a pan-European forum for interparliamentary dialogue which aims at having an impact in all Council of Europe member states. This reflection would also enable the Assembly to provide its own vision of the future of the organization. This reflection on our identity, which the Assembly will decide how to develop, appears to me to represent an extraordinary opportunity for our institution to reassert forcefully its own role as the guardian of European unity. I strongly believe all member states of the Council of Europe must participate in this process. In performing this task, we must not cease openly denouncing any violation of human rights and of international law committed in any part of our continent and by any authority. There cannot and must not be any free zones. However, this defense of human rights will be even stronger if we are able to combine it with an ever-increasing unity between our peoples. We must tirelessly seek to emphasize what unites us. And in so doing, we can draw support from the cultural and social dimension of our lives. Respect for human dignity forms the heart of the Convention and lies at the root of our European identity. There is this principle, which is certainly a legal and political principle, has been asserted th through a profound understanding of human existence, which is typical of European civilization. The centrality of human rights flows from an understanding of what it means to be human, which has grown out of a variety of tradition. The Convention stands on the shoulders not only of legal documents, such as the Magna Carta and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, but also the poetry of Dante, the plays of Shakespeare, the music of Beethoven, and the novels of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. No wall has been able to divide European humanism, which cannot thrive without all of these different strands. And today, now that we have torn down the walls, we must be able to bring to bloom, as never before, the pluralist wealth of this humanism. As guardians of European unity, we must enhance the role of European culture. In performing this task, we must form an alliance with the world of culture, schools and universities. The university is a typical European creation and has made a massive contribution to the creation of this shared culture. For this reason, it would be wonderful if our Assembly and the entire Council of Europe could be able to mobilize all European universities around the values of this European humanism and the defense of human rights, democracy and the rule of law. We already have a positive example of this, the academic network of the European Social Charter.
This is a network of teachers, researchers and students from throughout Europe which is united by its efforts to defend and promote the values embodied in the social charter. It would be a wonderful thing if we could encourage the creation of a European academic network for each of our conventions, taking the Council of Europe as its point of reference. I'm thinking here, first of all, of the Istanbul Convention or the Convention Against Corruption. These are issues in relation to which academic networks could be used to promote research, exchange of information and best practices, as well as the organization of training pathways. In other words, to mobilize efforts and to reinforce the connective tissue of European civil society. We therefore need to reaffirm the value of parliamentarianism at a time when the true meaning of democracy has become somewhat blurred. On the one hand, the various expressions of populism call into question the value of parliamentary democracy and the values of discussion and deliberation. On the other, the intrusiveness of the executive and at times authoritarian regimes constrains the power of parliaments. Our assembly, as a European assembly, can help all national parliaments recover the strength and the dignity of parliamentary work by finding common standards to guarantee their independence and integrity, their competence and effectiveness, and defending freedom of speech and dissent and the legal protection they enjoy, such as parliamentary immunity. Our battle against political corruption must be relentless, and this battle must be waged in our national parliaments, governments, societies, and our international relations, and especially in those institutions which deal with human rights, how much credibility can our reports and resolutions have if there is any suspicion that they have been influenced by private interest and undue interference? How can all those people whose rights have been violated or undermined or who have been unjustly imprisoned or marginalized by society for their opinions or orientation how can they have any trust or hope in our institution if we are suspected of being in the service of this or that power rather than in the service of human dignity? This is why it is essential that our institution can show impartiality and transparency. In this regard, we have taken significant steps by improving our rules of procedure and our code of conduct and setting up an external investigation body. The Assembly has made abundantly clear its intention to make every effort to dispel any misgivings about the way it works and to defend its reputation. We now need to put this into practice through the commitment of each and every one of us. Corruption is a cancer in democracy and a state governed by the rule of law and consequently must be combated with all the energy we can muster. In our parliaments and in our own parliamentary assembly we must reaffirm the responsibility that each member of parliament has to represent not only what is important to him or her, but also what is important to everyone. This is something we need to ensure happens here. Dear colleagues, here we sit in alphabetical order. Our assembly chamber is not divided into political groups or national delegations. And this means that each and every one of us must accept the responsibility for the whole. 
With just a few minor adjustments, we can embrace the famous words of Edmund Burke. I quote, Parliament is not a congress of ambassadors from different and hostile interests, which interest each must maintain as an agent and avo advocate against other agents and advocates. But Parliament is a deliberative assembly with one interest, that of the whole, where not local purposes, not local prejudice ought to guide, but the general good resulting from the general reason of the whole. If we adopt this transparency and this sense of responsibility for the whole, we can reclaim not only for ourselves, but also for our national parliaments, that sense of pride that comes from the best parliamentary tradition and which is expressed in the beautiful oath of allegiance to the king sworn by the Cortes of Aragon. Nos que somos tanto como vos, y todos juntos más que vos, os hacemos rey de Aragón, si juráis los fueros, y si no, no. We, who are as good as you, and together, better than you, make you king of Aragón, if you swear to observe our laws and customs, and if not, then we do not. In these words, the Republican tradition has always recognized the pride of those who consider themselves equals to the monarch and together greater than the monarch to whom they swear allegiance only if the sovereign abides by the laws. It is this pride and this courage that we must find once more. Many of our citizens are disillusioned with politics because they feel it is far removed from their problems and hardships. They are gravely concerned about the future because of the increasing number of environmental challenges and conflicts, and they regard politics as powerless. Rebuilding trust in democratic institutions is a huge task, but one we must take on courageously. We must once again have the courage to say what sort of society we wish for ourselves and for those dear to us. We do not want a society dominated by fear, the fear of women being attacked, children being abandoned and trafficked, minorities being discriminated, raped, the fear of not having work, of having no prospects, of not being able to express one's thought, of being alone, the fear of war and terrorism. We cannot remain indifferent to these fears, and we must ensure that our institutions can regain the ability to address these fears head on, to listen to them and provide comfort, to instill courage and hope. If there is one wish I have for us at this time, it is this, to be able to hear those fears and turn them into hope. At the end of the tragedy of totalitarianism, the dream of a united Europe was able to do this, and it built a continent out of the incredible spiritual and material resources that existed. Together, once again, we will be able to live up to this task. It is our duty to do our best to achieve this. 75 years ago, so the execution in Munich of the Weisserose students who, unarmed, opposed the Hitler regime, distributing leaflets in the university in which they denounced the criminal actions of the regime. Sophie Scholl, one of those students, had chosen as a motto the words of the French philosopher Jacques Maritain. Il faut avoir 
un esprit dur et un cœur tendre. One must have a determined spirit and a tender heart. A tender heart to feel the suffering of the world, a determined spirit to combat violence and fight to secure the freedom of everyone. Thank you very much for your attention.